Hello and welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio podcast. I am Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show for you today. This is the radio show for PhDs who want to get hired into their first or next job in industry and who want to thrive in business. Thank you for joining us. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Isaiah here with Cheeky Scientist. Welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. We have a great show lined up for you today. We're going to be talking with David Burkus. David Burkus specializes in making connections through loose connections. And we're going to be talking about how to use loose connections to get hired, to advance your career. Um, and, and by loose connections, we mean not just your direct connections, such as your direct connections on LinkedIn, but your shared connections, or as David's uh, books and talks calls them, friends of friends of friends. So there's a lot of studies that have come out showing that you're much more likely, for example, to get a job through a loose connection than through a very close connection. We're going to be digging into why that is, um, and we're going to be talking to, to David Burkus uh, about this. All right, so we are going to bring on Jeanette for the Show Me the Data section. I see a lot of new people watching. Great to have you on the Cheeky Scientist radio show. I see a lot of our Cheeky Scientist associates here in the private group that only members get access to. Prachiti is here. Good to see you on. Zia is here. Good to see you on too. Jones and Jeremy, Francisco, Connie. Great to see all of you on as well. So I'm going to jump to the Show Me the Data section. I'm going to bring on Jeanette first. Jeanette, I think you can let yourself on. Hello. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks awesome. for Awesome. Yeah, it's great to be here. And so we have a very special Show Me the Data section for today, all based on loose connections. Please do me a favor. If you're seeing Jeanette here, I'm going to move some things around on my screen. Do me a favor and say hello, Jeanette, in the chat box if you were able to see and hear her. Excellent. Hello. And let me share my screen. Thank you, Daria. She says, she says nice bow tie in the <laughs> bow tie immune now. I've seen so many bow ties on you. <laughs> yes, there's always a new bow tie when we have Jeanette on. So great. I'm really excited to show the data today because I, I think it's, you know, anytime it, we can create kind of a paradigm shift in your mind, change your perspective, show you that maybe what you're doing is the wrong approach and thereby save you time and help you get to your goal faster. It excites me. And one thing that you've maybe heard a lot about is that referrals are the best way to get hired. So we're going to talk about that first, but then we're going to talk about what kind of referrals, where do these referrals come from? What does the data show us? Uh, the first figure we're looking at here is sources of being hired. And this is from zarista.s3.amazonnas.com slash item. We'll put the link in the post show notes, but it's an article that's showing, showing the top source of hires. Referrals reign for hires. That's the subtitle. And what we're looking at on the y-axis is the percentage of applicants. And then on the x-axis are these different groups uh, of applicants in terms of where they're looking for jobs, right? Uh, different segments. Yeah, like, where the applicants came from. Where the applicants came from. So we have employee referral first, and then Indeed, LinkedIn, recruiter sourced, higher ed jobs, agency, campus recruiting, customer career site, Glassdoor career builder. Um, spoiler alert. Most of them are very, very low, <laughs> except for employee <laughs> referral and Indeed, but there's some interesting things here. So can you walk us through, the, especially the employee referrals Indeed, maybe LinkedIn and Recruiter Source too? What does it show? Uh, and, and the last thing that I'll mention uh, to help you, for those of you especially listening by audio, uh, to get your bearings is there's three different colored bar graphs. So red is the first color, it's total applicants. Blue is the second color, it's total interviewed. And green is a third color, total hired. So Jeanette, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, awesome. So this is, I just love the way that this data is displayed. Um, so the two that we'll really focus on, because like Isaiah said, they're the biggest, is when um, applicants come from an employee referral or they come from Indeed. Um, <clears throat> so what you can see is that the total number of applicants or like the percentage of applicants that come from Indeed is 50%. Right, so half of the people are applying to jobs via Indeed, right? The right. website. Um, it actually gets 
um, some of the data shows it's like the biggest one right now. It's get the most people are putting their applications through Indeed. Um, and then if we look at employee referrals, it's only like 12% of people are, are applicants are coming through an employee referral. And what this difference is showing you is that people are not putting the effort in to right. go and get a referral. Like most people are just submitting their resume online because it's easy, right? You just put it in there. So great, you applied, you feel good about yourself, but what comes next? Right. Do you get an interview, right? right? And the answer is you're way less likely to get an interview if you just supply online, like through Indeed. So right. only it's like 25% of those people with who got an interview came from Indeed, where it's more than 40% of those who came from a referral got an interview, right? So less people are applying using a referral, but those people who do apply that way are way more likely to get an interview. Like they are 40% of them get interviews, whereas right. only 25% of those who apply online got interviews. So, so there's- Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, so to, to, to sum up real quick where we are, there's this inverse relationship. Yeah. So you see this trend for employee referrals, the total number of applicants is a little above 10%, right? So only about 10%, and we've showed you this data before. We've seen the number as low as 7%, as high as maybe 15%. That's all, uh, you know, out of all job applicants, a very small percentage are actually doing the work to get referrals. Um, but of those people, those who get interviewed, it jumps up to over 40% of that job candidate pool. And those who get hired, it jumps up to about 55%, which is insane. And that number keeps climbing, by the way. It used to be 40 or so, right, five years ago, six years ago. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been about 50%. Now it's well over 50%. And for PhD level jobs, it's much higher. It's closer to 60 to 70% are from referrals. So I want you to just to think about that for a second. About 10% of job candidates will actually do the work to get a referral, which is not a big deal. It's as simple as having somebody directly pass your resume onto the hiring manager instead of just uploading it online, or it's using somebody's name because you had a conversation with them like in your cover letter. It's not that difficult, okay? But we, especially as PhDs, we just have this intense fear of doing it. Though these numbers are insane. Of that 10%, well over 50% are getting hired. Yeah. Right? And then yeah. Indeed is the opposite. Because let's face it, how easy is it, Jeanette, just to go on Indeed.com and like look for jobs? Right? Piece of cake. Yeah. I mean, Indeed's, and Indeed's like the, um, right now in today's, uh, today's world, it is the, the, the most the used online yeah. Yeah, job board. And so this is what we always say is like job boards, sure, they're easy. You don't have time in the lab. You, you know, you want to just get online, get on Indeed. The software interface is very simple to use. You find a job you like, you upload your resume, and you think that you did something great in your job search. <laughs> Again, it might get you hired for you know, a job at McDonald's, but for a PhD level job, um, and even in all jobs, which we're showing here, look at this. So 50% of the job candidates are just uploading resumes to Indeed. Those that are interviewed, it drops to almost as low as 20%. Those who actually get hired, down to 10%. It's almost exactly the reverse, right, of, mm -hmm. of the employee referrals. So, I mean, what are the key takeaways from this overall, Jeanette, beyond, beyond the obvious? <laughs> beyond the obvious one that you should really try to get an employee referral. Mm. Um, I think it's just to show you that that little, I feel like you get a little dopamine hit when you like submit your resume online, yes. that you need to try to like refuse that, right? Mm. And tell yourself, this is actually not a good thing right? I have just given myself a pretty terrible chance at getting this job, right? Yeah. Whereas if I could do something else, if I tried to meet someone new at an event or I reach out to someone new on LinkedIn, right. <clears throat> that is where you should really be getting your like fuel for your job search. Yeah. And it just comes down to, you know, uh, being uh, more strategic uh, or more tactical. As PhDs, we need to look at this data and act on the data. We can't just do what everybody else does, what feels good, right? We're all human. It's really just biology. When you upload your resume on Indeed, it's all in your hands. You do get a dopamine hit because you close a mental loop. Like you get it uploaded and it says, congratulations, you uploaded it. Now you feel really good like you closed a loop. When you reach out to somebody, right? You reach out for the first time to set up an informational interview or to ask for an introduction. It's open-ended. You don't get to close that loop that loop being closed is reliant on the other person responding to you. And that's why you will automatically feel this heaviness 
before you reach out to somebody, right? It's just like, oh, I don't want to do it because there's this uncertainty and your brain de-energizes you when there's uncertainty. Um, so very, very important. I, I want to just point out two other things, right? So applying on LinkedIn, the trend is the same as applying on Indeed because it's really just another job board. You're just uploading it. Um, but recruiters, it's valuable to build these relationships with the recruiters. Two things I want to show here. So the recruiter trend is very similar to the employee referral trend, right? A very large percent get hired versus uh, the total number of applicants. However, the numbers are so small compared to employee referrals. So if you're in your job search and you want to get fired, uh, hired the fastest and you want to make the, uh, you have the biggest chance of getting an interview, look at this chart. You're going to go directly to employee referrals. Find, get introductions to employees. You can find these employees on LinkedIn so easily. We talk about it all the time. Spend your time there. It's better to spend 10 minutes a day reaching out to one or two people on LinkedIn to get an introduction or reaching out directly to an employee than it is to upload your resume. So that's, that's really the takeaway here. Um, I, I just love that figure. So thanks for sharing it, Jeanette. Um, so conversion ratios, we're looking at the same reference here. Uh, on the left, we're looking at these dark blue boxes. It says external sources. On the right, it's internal sources. It's a, a, a white uh, boxes. And on the top two, uh, there's external sources, applications to interview. It says 29 to one. Interviews to hires, five to one. Applications to hires, 129 to one. And then the internal sources, applications to interviews, it's six to one. Interviews to hires, it's two to one. Applications to hires, it's eight to one. So what do these ratios mean? Yeah, I think the last one is my favorite. So that applications to hires, right? So external sources, that means 129 applicants, one hire. Mm. With internal sources, eight applicants, one hire. Mm. That is a huge increase in your chances, yes. right? It's like you just basically get to go to the front of the line. Right. Um, and it's, it's really quite extreme too for, for interviews, right? Uh, five to one versus two to one. So you're like 50% a chance getting an interview if you have an internal source. And as soon as you get into that interview, that's where you can like really let them know that you're the person. It's like you get, you have the chance to tell them if you can't get to that stage, you can't even really, you know, argue your point sometimes. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then the, a uh, similar comparison below, but here we're looking at the actual individual sources. Like, so then the external side, we're looking at Indeed, LinkedIn, higher jobs, and you see a, a very similar yeah. uh, level, right? So about a hundred to one for, you know, for Indeed, it's 130 to one, LinkedIn's 148 to one, but about a hundred to one chance of getting hired. Internal sources though, it's like single digits for the two that we've talked about. Employee referrals, seven to one, recruiter source, four to one. Um, so Jeanette, I mean, the one thing I want to mention here is you have to think of the context too. I think too many PhDs waste their time reaching out to recruiters. Recruiters are not the gatekeepers that they used to be, okay? And very often they will treat you like a number. Mm -hmm. their, their name of the game is just speed. They want to find the right candidate, get you hired. There's some great recruiters out there. We have some great recruiting partners. Um, there's nothing better than a good recruiter, but there's nothing worse than a bad recruiter. A recruiting shark, as they're often called, called who just looks at, you know, they ask you a question, do you need a visa? Yes, they hang up on you, right? Do you have industry experience? Yes or no, they hang up on you. They don't understand. They don't understand what PhDs have to value. They're not looking to build relationships. They're just looking for some quick data so that they can cut you out. And so I want you to, all of you to stop, you know, start of, get out of the mindset that a recruiter is like this magical gatekeeper. Instead, start thinking of, of how to get access to employees because you can't control that. All the employees are listed on LinkedIn for you. You find the company's name. You don't even have to be a premium member. It shows you who works there. That's magic for somebody like you who has a, a research skills. So just find those employees and start connecting with them, getting introductions to them, using loose connections, which is what we're going to talk about next. So Jeanette, the title here is Social Influence and Reciprocation in Online Gift Giving. <laughs> I was talking to Jeanette earlier how I cannot say reciprocity i said it reciprocity well done. <laughs> in front of an audience i'm always like reciprocity uh so social influence and reciprocity in online gift giving thank you lisa mary it's a big win for me today uh so it's at research.fb.com slash wp dash content uploads that we're just showing you where the figures are we're going to put the link in the show notes what we're looking at here is figures that look kind of looks like what you'd see from you know a study about how the flu virus travels through people, right? And 
you know, it's, I, these, these kind of studies always fascinate me, whether it's looking at emotions or behaviors and how they travel through social networks. I'm going to let you walk us through these two figures, though, Jeanette. Why, why does it look like a study of a flu virus, and, and what are we looking at? Yes. Um, so this study looked at, to give some context for what it is, um, a really like small example of this rule of reciprocity, right? So what they looked at was what happens when people give or get gifts on Facebook, right? You can like actually, I don't know if you can do it anywhere, but you used to be able to like give a gift on Facebook when it was someone's birthday, right? And that's what they looked at. And so they looked at how people acted um, if they didn't get a birthday gift or right. they got a birthday gift. Were they more or less likely to then give a gift? So on the graph here, the one on the left is in red and that's people who didn't get a birthday gift. And then the one on the right is in blue and it's people who got a birthday gift. Right. And the big comparison to make here is to look at the scales of the Y axis. So those people who didn't get a birthday gift, their rate of gift giving was less than one, right? So they're mm. meaning that not even everybody gave a gift to someone, right? So they're le less likely to give gifts to people. But if you look at those people who got a birthday gift, their rate of gift giving is uh, like right around the highest it gets is between 20 and 25, mm. right? So there's just this huge increase and the rate that these people are giving gifts to other people. And the difference between these two cohorts of people is the fact that they got a gift, right? So when, as humans, we get something, mm. you just naturally want to reciprocate that. And that is, that's what this tiny example is showing so clearly, that when people get a birthday gift, they're just more likely to give another gift. <laughs> No, and, and so what we're talking about here is, again, the law of reciprocity, right? The, mm -hmm. the, ur, the biological urge that you have, and you can look this up, you know, do your research, you're all PhDs. This is a real thing. When yeah. you get something, you are very inclined to give something back. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's why at airports, they've actually made it illegal now for people to hand out free pens, right? Whether it's for nonprofits, whatever, because people are so inclined to give something back. You used to have people that would go around and hand out free pens, et cetera, and then ask for money in return. It's, it's illegal at airports uh, because of a study that was done on this. If you're given something, a pen, a little trinket, doesn't matter how small, you want to give back so bad that people can manipulate you in this way. Mm -hmm. But this is a case where you can use that in a valuable way to build relationships. And by doing something right, instead of doing what most of us do, and we just think about how we can get, I need a job now, Look at my resume, help me, give me a job, right? Uh, this is what most of us do when we're in, we're in that desperation mode for a job. Instead, if you just follow one of the key cheeky principles of AVF, add value first, it opens up all of these different relationships, these loose connections that will lead to you getting job referrals and, and, and overall getting jobs. And you can see it in the data here, 25 fold increase, it's quite a bit, right? So if you add value to somebody, they're going to want to reciprocate. A very simple example is most of us think we need introductions to get hired. Why not give an introduction first, right? A great way to get to know somebody you don't really know well is to introduce them to somebody you do know well. And once you introduce them, right, that you can come back and ask for an introduction much easier than if you just went right ahead and asked for the introduction without adding value first. And there's a lot of different ways you can add value in a job search or no matter what your goals are. And when we're going to, we're going to talk about those. Yeah. Can I add one more thing about that figure before you scroll away? Please. Is, um, if you look at the X axis, it shows the days from that person's birthday, right? So I think this is important. You'll see that the closer it is to their birthday or when it's, especially when it's right after their birthday. So right after they've received a gift, right? Mm -hmm. If they got a gift, they were way more likely. You see this huge uptick in the likelihood that they're going to give a gift. Right. And I think this brings home a good point that for your job search, you can't just add value one time and walk away. Yes. Right. It needs to be consistent. You need to be at the front of their mind. Right. So as you're adding value, the like value of that value add will decrease over time. Right. Yes. So you need to keep refilling the tank. Is I think that's a really like what this shows really well that continue to do that. Don't just do it once and then be like, I'm out of here. Yeah. You do see this curve uh, starting to go down, right? So it starts mm -hmm. off at uh, the, the normalized uh, rate of 23 or 24, and then it gets down to about 20, a little bit below uh, after you move 30 days after. So yeah. yeah, right after it also shows a very key tenant of negotiation. Whenever you get something, um, 
they, you're going to get asked to give something right away and vice versa. If you make, if you make a concession during a salary negotiation or during any sort of uh, social interaction, that's the best time to ask for a concession. Okay. And we can go really deep into this and maybe we'll have time to talk to David about it, but right after you give is the best time to ask for something in return. And it's a great way to build relationships. The key is you're giving first. Okay. The very last thing I want to show here is something that looks like a firework on the screen or a series of fireworks. And it's another type of figure that you often see when it comes to studying contagions, right? And so Jeanette, we're looking at these, uh, these nodes and then a lot of arrows going away from these nodes very quickly. What are we, what are we looking at here? Yeah, this finger is just really cool because it shows that these people who have all like tons of nodes, like tons of lines coming off of them, they're often called, in this paper, they're called seeds. There are people who, like you should be, start giving before they get, right? And what they end up doing is they create this entire network around them of other people who start to feel the reciprocity law, right? And they start to give also. So you become a part of this huge network of people who are just giving things all the time. And that is a great network to be a part of. Right. And, and there are a lot of arrows here that go back the other way. They're not really studying that. But the key is that when you do this, you have a strong uh, impact on other people. Mm -hmm. They're going to be much more likely to give in return. The key is that somebody needs to initiate it. You need to seed it first. You have to see yourself as a seed, right? Not as somebody who's reaping whatever that seed's planted. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I want to recommend that a lot of you do, try just try this. Try one day to set aside a couple of hours in that day just to add value to people in your network. One way or another, you might have to spend five minutes reading their LinkedIn profile to see what they're interested in. And then maybe you send them like a link to an article from an influencer they're following. Maybe you introduce them to somebody else, right? Maybe you show appreciation or you congratulate them on a, a jump in their career, a recent change that they made or something that they announced. They're announcing it for a reason because they want appreciation or they're proud of it. And you comment on their post, something small. Do that just for a couple of hours and you're going to see a massive shift. You're going to see a shift in the way people approach you because you've just decided to act like a seed right? Instead of somebody who's just taking it, it has a dramatic impact. We talk to a lot of people in our association who are working in industry currently, and they say that it is such a breath of fresh air when somebody actually reaches out to them, makes a, makes a connection request on LinkedIn, adds a note, and then just adds value in that note and says, hey, I just wanted to stay in touch. I really like what you're doing in this field. Congratulations on XYZ. Keep up the great work, and that's it. They don't ask for anything. Like, it is so rare um, that it's going to really make you stand out and it's going to change the person's um, perspective of you and the relationship just by doing that. And that's something that we're going to talk a lot about today with our first guest, David Burkus, who we're going to bring on next. Please do me a favor and thank Jeanette for coming on to the show me the data section for all the work. She pulls the data. She does an incredible job finding things that are very relevant to the show. So please thank Jeanette in the chat box or in the comment box, wherever you might be watching this live stream. I'm very excited for our first guest today, our very special leadership guest we have on David Burkus. I'm going to show his bio here. We like to show a picture and then write out a little bio here. Uh, David is a best-selling author and sought-after speaker and associate professor, uh, professor of leadership and innovation at Oral Roberts University. That's right. He has a lot of experience in both business as well as academia. Perfect for this audience. His newest book, Friend of a Friend, offers readers a new perspective on how to grow their networks and build key connections. I'm going to show his book in a second. You have to go get this book. It's incredible for all of you who are looking to make those connections that will lead to job referrals and get you hired. Uh, the book is based on the science of human behavior, not rote networking advice. Finally, right? I, I can't stand these webinars, these books where it's like networking is important, you know, sh shake their hand firmly and smile. Like we're a little bit beyond this as PhDs and David's going to help us dig into the, to the science here. He's delivered keynotes to leaders of Fortune 500 companies and the future leaders of the United States Naval Academy. His TED Talk has been viewed over 1.9 million times. That's great. I'm about 1.9 thousand. <laughs> so this is a big number. It's a big deal. I definitely recommend you check out his TED Talk. We'll put that in the post show notes too. He is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review as well. Because we're all on LinkedIn so much, I want to show his LinkedIn profile. Please go to his LinkedIn profile, connect with him, add a note, congratulate him, thank him for being on the radio show. Let's show him how involved and engaged PhDs are. Um, please connect with him on LinkedIn and make sure you go to his website too. Lots of great stuff. I really like the feel of his website. 
great uh, format, very easy to find various links, very easy to find his TED Talk. Um, if you go to davidberkus.com, uh, you can find him there for LinkedIn. For those of you listening by audio, it's just linkedin.com slash IN slash David Burkus, B-U-R-K-U-S. And then finally, if you go to Amazon, just type in friend of a friend. The sub title is Understanding the Hidden Networks That Can Transform Your Life and Your Career. Very clever uh, book cover as well. We're going to put all of this in the show notes. Go get this book right now. I think for some of you, it might be free on Kindle Unlimited if you have that. Otherwise, uh, definitely get the, the actual hardcover. It's worth it. It's a great read. And without further ado, I'm going to bring on David now. I'm going to have him start his camera here. That should do the trick. And there he is, there David. Go, <laughs> you are. How are you? Great to see you. I'm good. Great to see you. Great to talk to you. How come we're not connected on LinkedIn? I noticed that when you pulled up my profile. I don't know. I haven't done what I'm telling everybody else to do. I got to send the note. I'll send the note. I'll add value <laughs> right after. I promise. <laughs> love no, it. We should, love it. I'm, I'm disappointed I didn't send one to you earlier. That's my bad too. So yeah. We should be connected. I know we've had that change. We, we were trying to get David on for quite a while now as we were building out the uh, infrastructure for the radio show and he was kind enough to uh, reschedule a couple of times. So do me a favor, everyone, and just say, for those of you that are our special associate members here in Zoom, say hello to David if you would. That'll also let me know that you can see and hear him. Uh, David, great to have you on. And I, I have so many questions. I wrote some of them down. But the first one I, wa I always want to ask, when, whenever somebody has a new book out, I know how big of a project a new, a new book is. There's always a strong reason why behind it, right? Because it's, not, it's, it's such an intensive uh, undertaking. What was the reason why you wrote Friend of a Friend? Yeah. Oh, thank you. No, there, there's always that underlying motivation. For me, it was that I think – there was, there's a gap in a lot of people's advice about building networks and, and how to understand when you're on. Like on, on the one side, and you actually mentioned it, you've got the advice books, the here's how to give a perfect elevator pitch and shake a hand firmly and all of that kind of thing. And, and like those are great, but they're pretty basic and there's a, there's a limit on them. And then there were the, I, I call them the fascination books, the books by actual network science researchers, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, Duncan Watts and those people. And they are very much like, here's how human networks work. Isn't this fascinating? But wow. nobody was standing in that gap, right? Nobody was like, well, if this is true, then what does that mean for people who are actually out there trying to grow their network and build their network? So that was, that was the idea was to create this sort of uh, bridge or literally to, to plug the structural hole between the advice books and the, the fascination books. In particular, to rewrite some of the stuff on the advice side, because a lot of it is, advice is autobiographical, right? And so unless you're that person in that industry or you have a really similar personality or background to that person, right. that his or her advice to you isn't all that worthwhile. But if you can figure out what's universally true about all networks, you can build out your own, oh, these are the steps I need to take moving forward. Yeah, and, and that's why I really love this book. And, if, and again, you should all go to Amazon and check it out because as PhDs, that's the gap that we're missing. And that's why most of us don't start networking because we're, we'll study it from the academic angle, the fascinating, like, wow, it does move through networks and these things are cool and it is like in Contagion or, you know, yeah, shake a hand. But what is that middle where you can go through a step-by-step, -step pro a protocol, right? For, for many of you, right? what's that protocol, that methodology? Um, the, the other question that I have to kind of set the, the stage here a lot of people watching right now, believe it or not, think that networking will not work for them, right? They, they think that networking is too painful or it won't work. It doesn't make sense. It's this hokey thing. I, got, you know, I have to be honest. I got into academia originally because I never wanted to have to network or rely on the power of pull. I wanted to be solely responsible for my career progress. But then you learn even in academia, right, that these relationships matter. The people that rise to the top, even in academia, are the people that are the most well-connected. So can you help us understand why networking might be important and why it actually does work and matter even to PhDs? Yeah, and, and here's what I'll say is the bad news is that like you're already in a network, but that's also good news, right? I even saw it in the comments already. Someone saying networking feels awkward. That is true. And there is solid research that even says that people who are asked to think about a time when they have to make a professional connection are more likely to have subconscious thoughts of wanting to get clean, right? So networking literally does make people feel dirty. I get it. The challenge, I think, for a lot of us is that we're, we're narrowing down our definition of networking to just making new contacts, meeting total strangers, going to that cocktail party, doing the shake the hands thing, mm -hmm. press and flesh, trading business cards, that kind of stuff. 
And the, I mean, the good, the good news, like that feels awkward. The good news is it's actually pretty ineffective too. I think a better perspective is that networking is anything that we do to understand and navigate the network that we're already a part of, right? So you are already embedded inside of a network. And the, the way that I say it a lot of times is that the, the best frame of mind is you don't, you don't, can't grow your network, can't improve your network, can't build your network, all of those trite phrases, because you don't have a network. It's not yours, you don't own it. You exist inside of a network already. Your job is to figure out where you are in that network and then how to go and be connected to the people that you want to be connected to. The best way forward through most of that is with people that you already know or people that are kind of one introduction away. So if those things make you feel sleazy, you have my permission to skip those events entirely from here on out. You just have to replace them with things that we know actually help people navigate the network that they're already in. Well, so let's, let's uh, take an example then. So you say start in, in figuring out where you are in your current network. That's where you want us to start, mm -hmm. right? So let's say we have, so we have people that are in academia. They know people like in their lab, their classroom, they have like an academic <clears throat> network. So how do they start from there? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the first thing is that we actually have to kind of, we have to look at what I call the hidden network. And these are, you, you had mentioned it was loose connections earlier before, before yes. I jumped on. If you think about the people that were in your lab or that were in classes with you or co-studying with you or, or that you are even at a conference with, those are really close, tight-knit connections. And the problem in a network is that, I mean, the, the fancy nerd, I don't get to get nerdy that, that often. The fancy nerdy term Bring is it on. transitivity, right? Yeah. Transitivity means that if person A knows person B and person B knows person C, there's a really strong likelihood that A and C already know each other, right? And so when we start with just that little crew, we're, not, we're actually not going to get a lot of new information, new ideas, et cetera. The problem is that then we, we jump right to that total strangers thing, right? So we know we want to get in a certain industry and we jump to that trade association where we, we, that's where we want to get and we're trying to meet a bunch of strangers and they're like trying to friend, you're an academic, what do you want to do here, right? All of those sorts of stuff. And it can get that awkward feeling, right? So the first thing that we got to do is look at and take an inventory of what we call our weaker or dormant ties, the people that we know, but we don't know that well. I like to think of these, if you want to use an academic track, these are the weak ties that you were an undergrad with, right? Because they went off into industry. Or the people that failed out of your grad program, right? Yes. Um, failing may not necessarily be a bad thing because you're trying to make the transition. And they may just be people um, that you that already made that transition that you just haven't talked to in a while. And the process of sort of rewarming those connections is going to go a whole lot further. And, you know, you talked about it a bit with the gift giving idea and we can settle down there. That's sort of strategy one. Strategy two we'll call exploring the fringes of our network. But yeah, so we, we stop on this on this reaching back out to weak and normatized thing. That's like step one, and it's really powerful. Yeah, so, and, you know, we talk about this a lot. Like, there's somebody in your network right now who can give you a job referral, just for those of you who are on that are, are most likely looking to take that next step in your career. Somebody is there right now, but they're likely dormant, okay? So that is what David is saying. How do you find them? You just start rewarming up these connections you've had. We talk a lot about accessing your alumni networks. That is something you have at least two alumni networks as a PhD, your undergrad and grad. You might have three if you're a postdoc. You go on LinkedIn, for example, linkedin.com slash alumni. You can find everyone who ever went to your school. There, there's an automatic built-in kind of rapport like David's talking about. So that's, that's the one example. And then finding out people who went, you know, the, that person down the hall or in the other classroom, that PhD that was there your first year, who went to go work for a company, right? Again, that's a, and another alumni network, but I think warming those up is a crucial first step. The second step, what you, what you just alluded to was, you said either gift giving or looking at the fringes. So where, where do we go next? Well, so I would put the gift giving thing as part of that first step of rewarming, right? And there's other things that you can do too. Like, if, so alumni networks is a great source. I, I actually tell a lot of people, like if you're already, have, if you're already active on things like LinkedIn and Facebook, that's awesome. Pull yeah. up your list of connections and then scroll all the way down because most of those are sorted by frequently contacted to unfrequently contacted. Or if you use like Gmail, if you're like me, you never clear out your sent messages, right? Which means that there are sent messages from five or six years ago in there. So if you bother to scroll all the way down, you're gonna see names that like, I haven't thought of that person in forever, mm -hmm. right? So once you have that sort of target list, it becomes that gift giving is a way to do it just what I actually like to say is, okay, sorry, you guys are really distracting me with the scoping out my bookshelf thing. <laughs> it is pretty off. Thank you. Um, I'm reading all these comments and, and whatnot. Sorry. So w what I like to do is actually you make out that list of what your targets are, and then you just 
get in the habit of keeping an open mind, trying to keep them at the forefront of your mind. You read an article that mentions the company that they might work at, or you read an article that reminds you of something that you talked to them three or four years ago. If you have nothing else, I will tell you, this is the easiest way to jumpstart a conversation. If you have nothing else to do and you don't have a lot of money to give random gifts to lots of people, send them an email that just says this, hey, I was thinking about you today and I hope you're well. No reply needed and then just sign it. Now, now why does that work? That works because only the most like awkward, toxic people would be mad at you because you were thinking about them and wanted to send good vibes. The no reply needed sends a little signal that you don't have an agenda. You're not trying to recruit them into your like network marketing thing. Like there's no agenda here. You're just, you're just wanting to catch up, et cetera. They will almost always reply. Like and when I tell people to do this eight out of 10 times, they come back to me and say, yeah, they totally, uh, they replied and we had this great conversation. But people love to just hear that you were, you were thinking about them. If you, if you literally were thinking about them instead of just you were thinking about them because you saw them on your LinkedIn list, right? Um, then it's even better because you can tell them why and you can jumpstart that conversation. But it'll serve to jumpstart conversations and it'll reset what I call sort of the, the clock of awkwardness, the longer period of time or the stopwatch of awkwardness, right? Longer period of time you go before between interactions, the more awkward it is for you to reach out to them or them to reach out to you. And that's all you're doing at first is just reset that clock with this little well wish. It may turn into a conversation. Even if it doesn't, it's an excuse to keep up with them moving forward. So in, in addition to gift giving, that's one of my favorite things to tell people to do. And I, I just, I've seen some comments and I, I, just, I know uh, what a lot of you are thinking. First of all, this does really work. It's got, it's that simple. And we've talked about like, if you reach out to somebody and congrats, you know, tell them happy holidays during a holiday, whatever, it can be such a short thing. It, it does, you don't need a, some dramatic reason to reach out. You can say you were just thinking about them. If that sounds weird to you, I know we have people from different countries, et cetera, and you're like, I would never send this. That's probably your weirdness. Other people aren't going to worry about that, especially non-academics, like just saying reaching out, uh, uh, just saying you were, you're reaching out because you were reading an email from, you know, an email came up from the past or something like that is a very good strategy. If the thinking about you part is weird, just recall your last interaction with them and just say you were remembering the last time you saw them at this conference. You were remembering when you were talking about them, talking to them by email about this. Hope they're doing well. I love what David said about no response needed. There's, it's like you're giving them the gift of freedom. It's a great way to add value. They don't have to do anything. You're literally just giving them something nice. They don't have to do nothing. That's what makes it seem like a gift and kind of plants that seed of uh, reciprocation for later. So, Okay, yeah. so, that, so now we're at the gift giving, the simple message is, where do we go from there? So now, so we're, we've rewarmed a lot of those connections and one of the most potent things that they can be for us is if they, if they already work at a target firm, great, but if not, they can help us explore those fringes, those people that are one degree of separation out. I'm a total nerd and so I've been fascinated by the fact that we have proven time and time and again this whole six degrees of separation phenomenon. We also know that Kevin Bacon's not all that important to the six degrees of Kevin Bacon because anyone's network is so resilient that you have those. I'm not actually interested in the idea of like in six introductions you could meet the president. A lot of people aren't interested in meeting the president right now, right? So that's fine. What I am interested in is that if, you are, if there are 7.5 billion people connected by six degrees, then think about how many millions or tens of millions of people are one degree out. Most of the professional network that you need is probably already one degree out, right? So what I encourage people to do, rather than do the sort of LinkedIn stalking where you look up the company and then you try and you see this person's a third degree connection and you try and build a path, as you're rewarming those loose connections, get in the habit of also asking, hey, who do you know in blank? which is an open-ended question. It, it'll invite a couple different things. The, the first thing it'll do is it'll get you probably two or three names. And when I say blank, blank is the industry, the city, the company. It usually works best with industry in the case of trying to transition industries. But who do you know in blank, this industry that I'm trying to get into? You'll get two or three names. You'll also, you're likely to get names that that person's already comfortable introducing you to right? Every introduction is also a recommendation. If I introduce Isaiah to someone, I'm also vouching to that other person that Isaiah is worth talking to, is worth spending time with. And if you turn out not to be, that harms me as the person introducing them. 
So I'm likely, if you say, who do you know in blank, I'm probably not going to list the names of people that I'm sort of on the fence building my social capital with that I don't necessarily want to spend on you. I'm going to give you the names of people I'm intro- like I'm, I could actually introduce you to. Yes. So now you've got lists of names of people that you know you could get connected to if the time comes. Don't ask for the connections right away. What I like to do is ask lots of different people and then with people, right? Whose name is a really strong indication that you are going to click with this person, but also that you um, could put different people putting a good word in for you at the same time. It's just going to be a more beneficial connection to you than that name that only got like tersely mentioned once, that type of thing. So who do you know in blank? It's a great question for exploring that one degree of separation out and getting way more names that are in that industry that you're looking to get into. Absolutely. You know, and we talk a lot about just to, to draw a parallel at the end of an informational interview, always ask, is there anyone else that might be worth me talking to about blank, right? Another type of open-ended question. These scripts are really powerful. If you just rephrase things slightly differently, make it uh, a non-aggressive ask, right? Where you're getting too specific and, and you want, you're asking for them to like physically help you do something. It's, it's much easier to keep uh, your network building. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about these scripts. Uh, someone like you is going to have a lot of different scripts that just have that magic turn of phrase that'll have people open up. Is there any other uh, open-ended questions or different ways to say things that you've seen really benefit people in terms of networking? Yeah, I mean, I'll say, who do you know in blank is one of my favorites. And, and of course, there's been a couple of people in the chat talking about how this phrase and this phrase is awkward. You're going to have to rephrase it in a way that you're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess my, my other big thing in terms of terms of phrase that can work really well is let's say you did go to that uh, networking event, that conference, that meetup. You're, you're working your, your weak and dormant ties. You're exploring the fringes, but you want to scale it up by going to a lot of those events. Well, I, ironically, some of the best questions you can ask at those events, we know this from the research, are questions that are non-work related, right? And you might get really excited because you serendipitously met someone who works in the industry that you work in, but your goal in that first meeting is to build rapport, right? And the best way to do that is what in network science is called multiplexity, which is this fancy term for the idea that the more context for connection we have for someone with someone, the more likely we are to build a relationship with them, the more likely we are to stay in touch with them, which is crucial. This pinging them on a regular basis thing is a crucial part of this. And that happens when you get to know and make a lot of different connections, when you explore them from multiple different angles, right? The, another term that's used instead of multiplexity is uncommon commonalities. You're at a trade association event for this thing, but it's the people that you actually find something other than that in common with that you're going to build the deepest relationship with. Mm. And by the way, being an academic trying to get an industry, you're not going to have a lot of work related commonalities off the bat anyway. So I encourage people drop questions like what do you do, drop questions that are work related and actually ask non work related questions or ones that could be answered open-endedly. Like one of my favorites is what excites you right now. Yes. Um, which can mean work related, or it could be that my kid just started soccer, right? It could be that, or what are you looking forward to? It's another way to phrase the same question. What's the best thing that happened to you last year? All of those. I'm again, sort of nerdy. So my, if I'm feeling like a click with someone, one of the questions I like to ask before we sort of let them go and go off to a different conversation is who's your favorite superhero? Um, the reason being everybody has a favorite superhero or they hate superheroes in either case, there's a story behind it, and that story lets you get to know that person in a way that's a little bit different than them. Um, there's also, I mean, there's some good research on just the idea of keeping questions going to them, being that they'll like you better because, I mean, you're, we always think that if we only talk, Isaiah, if you and I only ever talk about Isaiah, you're going to walk away thinking, I'm a great conversationalist. All I actually did was keep the conversation focused on you. But more importantly, you build that multiplex tie and you find additional ways to keep in touch with that person, right? If you told me your favorite superhero is Spider-Man, then come July, we have something to talk about because the movie is coming out. And even if that's what I send you, instead of a work-related little ping to my loose connection that I met, that can be hugely beneficial. But you only get that by asking the right, these sort of multiplex questions. Absolutely. I mean, and you heard two things there that we talk about a lot, right? Asking a question that's open-ended about what they're excited about and looking forward to. What's going on in your life you're excited about? I mean, that is by far going to get you an incredible response, much more than what do you do for work? And and a lot of cultures don't like you asking about work when you're at networking events. Um, 
And so I, th I think that's, that's a great question. I also think what you said about, and a lot of people don't understand this, but you don't have to say anything to impress the other person. The more you get somebody talking about themselves and what they're excited about, the more they like you and the better they remember you. There's, there's so many studies on that, like David uh, uh, discussed. So I, I highly recommend that. Last question, David, is what about people who don't, don't have time? You know, I know you've written about this before, whether it's new parents people who are finishing their PhDs, people in general just don't have a lot of time to network. What strategies do you have for them to actually start getting ahead in this way? Yeah, so I mean, I would actually offer that you have more time than you think. You may not have time to go to these events and plan your awesome superhero question and that kind of stuff. I totally get it. But you have time to reach back out to dormant ties. You have time to ask the who do you know in blank question. If, if nothing else, you make it a point to like, I'm gonna reconnect with four dormant ties a week. What we talked about in those emails, finding a, an article to send them, whatever, that's 30 seconds, maybe a minute. So we're talking about like five to 10 minutes of your week that can have a huge effect. Now, if it turns into a conversation, yes, you've got to carve out the 30 minutes or so to have that conversation. If you're, especially if you're looking to save time uh, in terms of, and, and, and you're sort of geographically limited, then things like this, a Zoom call instead of let's meet for coffee can be huge because it can be 15 to 30 minutes instead of like, I mean, I'll be honest, nobody wants to have coffee with you. Coffee might be a meeting for an hour, but I got to drive there. That's 30, 45 minutes, right? Then the time, it just, but if you say like, you know what I would love is to jump on a quick Skype call or Zoom call for 30 minutes and chat about this, you're much more likely to get a yes. And it's better for you time-wise too. The other thing that I think is good is leveraging this multiplexity thing. So like working parent idea, et cetera. Um, I actually, I know which work contacts have um, children and have spouses and things like that. And I usually, if I'm, if I'm in a city where I'm looking to reconnect with them, I'm doing it in a family thing, not in a, in a work context. Because I'm more likely to get a yes, but it's also going to fit into those other hours of the day that I have. Mm. Yeah, well said. And I think no matter what you're up against right now, right? Maybe you are trying to get a paper out, you're trying to graduate, et cetera. There are these small things that you can do, like David said. David, thank you so much for being with us. Really great to have you on. And uh, I'm very excited to uh, have some of our uh, attendees read your book. Is there anything else that they could check out if they're just starting to get into the world of step-by-step -step scientific backed networking to get a job? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the book is chock full of that. So I would check that out. I saw a couple people in the chat asking about certain questions. And so there is an article, if you just search David Burke's eight questions, you'll find it as an article that I did for HBR on eight questions you can ask instead of what do you do? So that might be a good quick read on that scripts element. The book is going to be chock full of those um, network science. There you go. You already found it. Um, it's going to be chock full of those other insights. So the combination of those two things, I think would be really, really good. Excellent. I'm definitely going to check out this article. Wow. And I love this cover. Was this, uh, how many, <laughs> how many cover had, I, did you have? I had, I had nothing to do with it. That was actually the in-house designer and that was her first idea. And I was like, done. Don't even change the color scheme. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it too. I love it too. What's your, what's your favorite chapter of this book? Like what's the chapter you've had the most feedback on in terms of people just same so I way. usually get the most feedback on that fringe of that C or whole network chapter, chapter two, and the strength and weak ties. Me personally, my favorite chapter is chapter seven, which is about preferential attachment. It's that idea that, you know, those, those uh, seeds, those nodes in the diagram you showed earlier before I came on, we call those super connectors a lot of times. And it's tempting to look at those people and be like, oh, the deck is stacked against me. What preferential attachment shows is that the more connections you get, the easier it gets to make new connections over time. So it may feel like you're pushing a rock uphill, but preferential attachment shows that eventually it starts going downhill and starts working for you too. So that one gives me the most hope. That's why it's my favorite personal. Excellent. All right, great book. It's called Friend of a Friend, David Burkus. David, thanks so much for coming on. Better than we could have imagined. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. All right, please thank David in the chat box if you have not. Wherever you are watching this, please say thank you, David. Please reach out to David by LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm a PhD. I saw you on Cheeky Scientist Radio, and I want to say hello. Maybe you'll get a free gift. We're all about gifting today, so go ahead and do that um, and check out the book, Friend of a Friend, too. Are you a PhD student or postdoc who wants to get an industry job? Are you tired of being paid one-third or less of what you are worth in academia? 
but you don't know where to start. Maybe you've been uploading resumes over and over again, but you haven't heard anything back from an employer. Go to phdsgethired.com and get our free materials on how to get hired in industry. All you have to do is go to phdsgethired.com put in your name and email address, and we will send you our resume guide, our networking scripts, and our other free trainings to help you start your job search now. Again, just go to phdsgethired.com. We're going to jump right into our next guest, Disha, Disha Nath, who I just found out we, we like to shorten her. I guess she prefers her name shortened to, to Disha instead of Disha Ree. And I'm going to share my screen one last time here. This is our, our final guest. We're going to be talking. I, thought, I, I think Evgenia is ready to come on. Oh, okay. We're going to bring on Evgenia first. Great. We didn't know if we were going to get Evgenia. So Evgenia is at a conference. She is a medical writer and she is the program leader of the medical writing organization. Uh, she's actually at which conference? Let's find out. I'm going to make sure she can jump on here. Evgenia, you should be able to pop on now. And let me do, let's see if we can get her on here. I'm guessing she's on mobile. It might just take one second. There we go. That button might help you, Evgenia. There you go. Oh, you're at the hotel. Okay, so it's much easier. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Which conference are you at? Uh, European Medical Writers Association Conference. They run two annual conferences, and this time I'm in Vienna in Austria, and this day has been already amazing. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Like I'm running off to a, a editorial board um, meeting dinner thing. Uh, but uh, I really wanted to be here at least for a couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks for jumping in. So we, we wanted to see if we could get Evgenia, even though she's at a conference, because uh, our new advanced program, the Medical Writing Organization, is opening on Monday. Evgenia has worked long and hard on this for about a year. I mean, it's finally here. It's always, it's always exciting when we get to that point of being able to bring a new program. There's been a high demand for medical writers right now, and it's an umbrella term for so many different positions in science communication. We found one of the leading experts in this field of Genia, whether she believes it or not, she's on the editorial board. She goes to these conferences. She's been in the field for a long time. Evgenia, two quick questions while I have you. First, give us something cutting edge that you learned at this conference about the medical writing field. What's something that you learned that excited you in, in this past, past day? Is this the first day of the conference? Uh, yeah, it's, it's my first day. And actually, it's, it's funny because this is the first, and it comes like very, it, it um, kind of like binds very well, like with the networking that you were just, uh, just yeah. talking about. It's like, this is the first time that I'm here just for networking. And well, and actually, I'm running an event tomorrow morning, wow. but like, I'm not taking any workshops. I'm not doing any of the technical stuff. Yes. And it has been amazing to connect to people like those who I knew from other conferences and this time. And, and I totally agree on like connecting on a personal level, mm. you know, like I, I find that my, I build my trust by sharing personal things with mm. people within my network. It's like, it, it, it's so amazing. They just like connect with you without the need to like justify what are like your skills, what's your experience, what you've been doing. They're like, they're just there and you can feel it. Yeah. And you know, I think like this time, this is one of my biggest takeaway messages kind of like really being here and connecting with people and like being present, like, like really being with a person that you're talking to, even though it's like five minutes or half an hour. And are you amazed by how many people are in the medical writing field now and how fast it's growing? What are some of the, the differences do you see? Do you see a lot more engagement this year? Um, I see more engagement. I see more people at the conference and maybe what's happening now is that the trend is more that people is coming maybe for a day or two because mm -hmm. this is a five day co day conference wow. um so like well like three or four years uh, ago it was more like people coming for the whole conference mm -hmm. so now we have more attendees but they're like usually they go for specific events like a workshop or like a symposium or a specific seminar um 
and yes. yeah and also like there are like so many different trends within medical writing and like now one of the things that i've been talking to to someone like like during lunchtime today it's the trend towards like more like what's going on in the artificial intelligence and digital health mm. realm which is amazing because like for some medical writers, it's kind of like quite scary what's going to happen in that field. Um, but there are like some things that we can, so many things that we can leverage from that as well. So staying ahead of the curve, right? As content writing becomes automated in some sense, um, it becomes more and more important to stay ahead as, as the medical writing field becomes more competitive. I, I see what you're saying there. Uh, last question, what are you particularly excited about for Monday with the medical writing organization when it opens and this new program? I'm actually uh, super excited about seeing people grow, you know, like seeing where they're coming from, what they're like each, like each member unique skills mm. that we can work on and leverage and build others. And really like, I'm super excited to see where they will get in. I don't know, like we never know. It might be like a month, two, a year uh, until they find like their, their dream job. But I'm really excited to see that and to share that journey with them. Yeah, and there's a, just a lot of different roles right now. I mean, I know you've mapped it out in the program, but uh, the different sectors, the regulatory writing, the, the medical communications, education, uh, all different types of, of jobs in the scientific communication field. and it's very, very popular right now, very hot, right? You said the conference is bigger than ever. Uh, so Evgenia, thank you very much for popping on and saying hello to everyone. Great to see you on. Please say hello to Evgenia in the chat box and say thank you for being here with us. Uh, you will hear more from her on Monday if you're on the Medical Writing Organization waitlist. Thank you, Evgenia. Thank you. So I'm just gonna put that waitlist the, on the screen here real quick one more time. Please do me a favor and say thank you to Evgenia if you uh, oh, you were you were able to see her. So just say thank you to Evgenia if you would. And then one more time, this is the page, the Medical Writing Organization. Um, if you're not interested in medical writing, it's okay. We're just showing this because it's a brand new program. Oh, it's a year of work goes into these programs because we build them out to have a completely separate dashboard, a separate board. Uh, as in board members, because we give board back certificates to our advanced programs. Uh, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's been built out. It's excellent. It's, it's uh, one of our highest level courses. There's six modules for this course. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, just go to this medical writing waitlist page, cheekyscientist.com slash MWO dash learn dash more and put your name on the waitlist. Just put your name and email in, and then you will get all, in, all the information about the program when it opens up on Monday. Okay, so we're going to jump back here to Dishari Nath. Uh, she did her bachelor's in biotechnology from India, and then a PhD in biomedical sciences from SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. Uh, towards the end of her PhD, she realized she wanted to get into a communication-based role in industry. She joined the Cheeky Scientist Association, and then she got her job uh, recently as a science writer so we have this theme, obviously, uh, of under the medical writing um, umbrella. Dishari is a science writer at the Journal of Visualized Ex Experiments. This is an industry company also known as Jove. Her job lets her explore her inner creativity to explain science, and she's loved every moment of it. Her LinkedIn profile is here. It's linkedin.com slash I-N slash D-I-S-H-A-R-E-E, Dishari. So Dishari, great to have you on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and let's bring you on the camera here. That button should help. There we go, gallery view. Hi, Dishari, let me get you off mute real quick. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, great to see you on. Can you all hear me? We can, if you can hear and see Dishari, can you say hello? And you said you like, is it, is it Disha you prefer? You can call me Disha, yes. Disha, all right, that's easier. So say hi, Nisha, if you haven't already. Thanks for being on. Really great to see you. Um, I appreciate you being willing to share your insights. You know, one insight that we all like to know as PhDs is, what was your motivation? Why did you want to get into a scientific communications role? Why did you decide to leave academia? Yeah, so um, a year ago, I was wondering the same thing, like, what would I do? Where would I go? And um, a good point for me to start was to really understand what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and 
what was I good at. So uh, looking back, I did a lot of um, inner reflection, trying to understand what I liked. And I realized that the part of my PhD that I liked the most was when I was presenting at the conferences, at seminars, or just having people over explaining my work to them. That's the first part I liked the most. And um, I talked to my community members about going to a communications-based career, and they really encouraged me to do it. And, and doing those reflections, I realized that was probably the place for me to go. And then I started talking to people who were in those positions to kind of consolidate my understanding of them and my um, eagerness and uh, wanting to go into those roles. So it was, it was a learning curve for me also, and also getting over the mental block of not being a scientist at the bench. But I, I kind of knew like towards the latter half of my PhD that I didn't want to be at the bench anymore. I just had it in my head. It took me a while to kind of accept that and go from there. Yeah, and I think for all of us, we go through this process of saying goodbye to academia. And what helps you say goodbye is having something you're excited about, right? So you, you zero in on these career paths. That's why it's so important to first figure out the professional lifestyle you want and then to start matching job titles to that. Don't search for the job title first. Figure out what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's, that's what Disha did. And then when you're excited about that, again, it will be that extra push you need to be able to say goodbye to academia, to reprioritize your life. Um, and in terms of reprioritizing, what did you do um, to start cracking in to the scientific communications field? What did you do to start networking? What did you do to start uh, looking at your current skills or gaining new skills? Um, so Cheeky Scientist was instrumental for me to do that. I got a lot of guidelines of how to get started. And uh, the biggest decision for me was to make it my priority. And that is very different from when you just think about it to when you actually do it. Yes. Um, and what I did was, when I was writing my thesis towards the last four or five months of my PhD, I was actually devoting 50% of my day towards my job search and 50% towards my finishing up in lab and thesis writing. So I made it my priority. I made some people around me a little mad, but I, I had to do it. I put my entire work for my entire understanding and my energy into it. And that really helped me get to my goal. Also, since I had a focus, that I was gonna go into these roles. I wasn't gonna apply for a postdoc. I wasn't gonna go into a scientist role. I had a very specific set of goals. It made it easier for me to focus and put my entire energy into that. So it's, when you, once you make that commitment, you would see it through. Well, good for you, yeah, because I think a lot of us, and I know a lot of us that are watching here, um, we haven't made that shift. We're scared to reprioritize because we're like, I can't possibly not spend 100% of my time finishing my thesis, or I cannot possibly spend 100% of my time making my PI happy, or TAing, or finishing my paper, my postdoc, etc. But you really have to, and it should be at least half. I'm really, really proud of you for taking 50% of your time and putting it towards your job search because nobody's going to carve that time out for you. Until you carve out that time to dedicate to your career and your job search, all you're doing is helping other people's careers whether you're, it's your advisor, the PI, et cetera. So you really have to do that. So you started carving out that time. That's the, that is the first step, making a decision to say, I'm going to set aside time to do this. I'm going to make this a priority. And then you started filling it with different activities. So I want to dig into the networking piece again. I know networking helped you in terms of your career. What did you do networking wise? What, what actually led to you finding the position? <laughs> it's funny, uh, me coming after David work today, uh, to talk about this because I did get my job through a friend of a friend. So <laughs> that was that was like when I when I saw him coming, it was like wow, this is perfect sequel to it. Um, yes. So I actually focused a lot on networking, and by networking, I actually did what um, David was saying was to reach out to my loose connection. So I reached out to a lot of my alumni from my undergraduate as well as my graduate school. And I remember I reconnected with a lot of my friends from back in undergrad who are right now in U.S. in different industries. Yes. I to them, um, I remember one of the alumni from my current graduate school who helped me a lot with my resume. Like, see, she is one of the reasons I could, I got an understanding of how much I needed to change my resume for the job. So I'm really grateful for, to those people. And the person that I got my job through, I had met her at my friend's place once and my friend's wedding a second time. I've met her twice in my entire life. 
And when I when I heard that she used to work at Joe at my company, and I reached out to her asking about the company and how she liked. And she was an ex-employee. Honestly, I wasn't expecting a referral. I, I just wanted to know about her and her work and the company. And it turns out she knew the director of my department. And wow. she connected me with him. And I got a director referral, honestly, to get into the job that I am right now. So it was, uh, I didn't, going in, I didn't think I was going to refer, get a referral. Like, that wasn't even my intention. I just wanted to learn more about yes. the people in my network as well as the work they do. And um, that led to where I am today. Yeah, and I think that's the approach that you need to have is I, I want to get to know more people. I want to learn more about the position instead of having this approach of I just want to ask for a job or have somebody give me something. Uh, come to it with more of a discovery mindset. And a big part of this is doing it well ahead of time. I and mean, what's amazing about your story is you finished your thesis and transitioned right into industry. A lot of people think that they need to do a postdoc or they have to have this in between. You don't. You can get your PhD and go right into a job. You just need to get out in front of it. If you wait till you're done with your thesis, now you're in desperation mode. You're either unemployed or working for free. You're scrambling, reaching out to people, and they can sense that you're desperate. And a lot of people end up uh, like that. And then for that reason, they take a postdoc and they end up stuck in a postdoc for many years because they never get in front of their job search. They never prioritize like you did. So you got into this career. What was onboarding like? What was it like to, for the first few weeks? It's a, it's a new experience, right? What, how, how long did you have to train for? Did you have somebody personally train you? This is always a question that we forget to ask, but I, I wanted to ask, well, you know, you got hired. What happened after you got hired? Um, so here, Jove is sort of a smaller company. Um, so we don't really have an uh, onboarding ritual, so to speak. Um, but my manager is very nice. My team is four people. And she went over uh, what I needed to do in a nutshell. And um, to be honest, I kind of learned on the job a little bit. Um, but here, it's also a lot of being proactive. And uh, so I need to I need to tell you a little bit about what I do. Yes. So basically, Joe has a unique product, which is it's a video of scientific concepts and experiments. So I am basically, I write the screenplay for those videos, explaining the scientific concepts, partly as an animation, partly as a live video. So um, we need to collaborate with authors with the labs that are doing experiments. We need to collaborate with illustrators, videographers, editors. So it's really up to the person coming in to proactively reach out to these people and understand what they're doing and how to better that communication. So there is a short onboarding process, but a lot of it is being proactive, which, um, which I think it is there in most jobs, but this specifically, I, I felt it a lot. It was very much up to you how much you wanted to learn. Yeah, so let's talk more about the day-to-day. -day. So you, you get hired, and what, you know, what's great about scientific communications, it, it can be so many things. It can be writing a, a screenplay or a script, or it can be writing something marketing-related, something for videos. Uh, so you got hired, and you write, you basically write down what somebody's going to perform on camera in terms of a scientific experiment, correct? Right. Can you talk a little bit about how your day is divided up, right? Do you have a certain number of meetings per week? or how your week's divided up, I guess, certain number of meetings per week, how much time you spend writing, et cetera. What does your, your day-to-day, -day, your week-to-week -week look like overall? Um, so it varies a little bit onto the day-to-day, -day, but I am in charge of different parts of, that, of each project. So I am first writing a script for uh, people acting out. I'm also writing a script and a storyboard for an animated concepts part of the video. Mm. Um, so after that, I'm collaborating with videographers to make sure I'm communicating my information to them. Then I'm looking over the footage and the animations once I'm coming back to make sure that everything was done correctly. And after that point, we're going back and forth with the editors to make sure the finished product matches what we wanted. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm either focusing on one or more of these parts of multiple projects at a time that are at different phases of their development. Um, and we have team meetings once a week. I meet with my manager once a week to go over my personal development, as well as we meet meeting for the whole department with the video people, as well as the script writers to discuss the progress of it. And we set milestones, we set deadlines, and we, every week we go over where we are in terms of those milestones, and we set new milestones for after that. 
Excellent. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, roles like this, again, with the medical writing umbrella overall, science communications, there's so many different types of jobs out there. And there can, there can be a lot of crossover. You might be doing something that's uh, as unique as writing a screenplay, but also has a scientific component. You, you could be doing regulatory work. You could be mark, doing marketing work, medcom, a lot of different options. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on to share your story, Disha. I do want to ask you one more question. Uh, what, what do you do in terms of when you're looking ahead in your career now, right? So you've started this new job. Where do you go from here? What does the career trajectory look like? What are the different types of people that you connect with at Jove? What are you doing, doing actively uh, for your own network, right? So obviously in a career, you get that first job. It doesn't stop. My point here is to let everybody know that these kind of things continue. They change shape a little bit. The priorities shift a little bit. What, is, what does it look like for you moving forward? Um, so right now, I am focusing most of my energy to understanding within Joe because we also ourselves have communications department that works outside of the company to mm. reach out to our clients, which is something that I do want to get to into in the future. So I talk to people who do that at the company to learn about how they go about these things so I can get understanding. Also, I think... Um, the core of my work at Job is basically distilling information for a certain kind of scientific audience. And I think that's a mindset more than learning the job and that can be applied to any kind of job. So I am looking uh, to start uh, technical medical writing also on the side in the next few months, um, which would really uh, broaden my understanding. So what I'm learning is distilling the information I can apply to that, that to the medical writing also. So I do want to do all of these things. And eventually, my personal goal is to go into something that has uh, the component of writing as well as the component of client facing. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to get more of that experience and go down that route. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Disha. Congratulations on your transition. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on to share your, your insights. Please do me a favor in the chat box or wherever you're watching to say congratulations to Disha on her recent transition and for sharing her career path. One thing we try to do for every radio show is discuss a unique career path that a PhD is on. We discuss their transition, what they do day to day, and, and where they're headed. So again, thank you, Disha. Great to see you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank week. you. Great to be here. That, this takes us to the end of this public portion, the public portion of the Cheeky Scientist radio show. I want to thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, today's radio show is all about getting hired through loose connections. Special thanks to David Burkus. Make sure you check out his book, Friend of a Friend. Special thanks to Disha uh, for coming on and talking about her career in the scientific communications field, which is under that larger umbrella of medical writing. If you are interested in an advanced course on medical writing, make sure you go to the Medical Writing Organization waitlist to learn more about the program. It's cheekyscientist.com slash mwo dash learn dash more. If you want to learn more about getting hired in industry overall, more about the Cheeky Scientist Association, just go to phdsgethired.com, phdsgethired.com. As always, rem remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional. This takes us to the end of another Cheeky Scientist radio show podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you want to learn more about transitioning into your first or next job in industry, just go to phdsgethired.com. Go to phdsgethired.com. We will send you all of our free training materials that will help you start your job search now or help you take it to the next level in business. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional. Bum, 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 bum,